Hello, I'm Hans Beesmer. I've been a programmer for 40 years and I'm using Ford. Ford is a deceivingly simple language that is notoriously hard to master, but it enables me to make more complex programs and faster than I ever could in C. In this series I'm breaking down some of the most intriguing projects I took upon me. Some while ago I watched a YouTube video of a guy who claimed to have designed a new language. And since I've been developing languages for quite some time now, that drew my attention. After all, designing a new language is not a small feat, I can tell you that. And what I saw angered me. How in the world was it possible that this guy had the nerve to claim he had designed a new language? I will tell you why, but first we have to delve into the stack of programs and subsystems that make up a language. For that I've designed a tiny C program. It's not much, it just initializes a variable and conditionally adds a value to it. And now we will see what happens when we compile it. First we hand it over to the preprocessor. The preprocessor is a bit like a streaming editor. It changes your shortcode in some predetermined manner by replacing some expressions and doing stuff like including header files. But what comes out is still source code. Note how our comment disappeared and how the constant we defined was replaced by an actual value. Now I cannot show you the output at this stage, but what Alexa does is break up the source code in individual words, which can be comfortably fed to the next stage. We call these tokens. And that's why some call it a tokenizer. This stage starts by making sense of your source code. We begin with main, which is identified as a function, which it basically is. It's got two parameters, rc and rv, and they are properly typed. Then we got a variable declaration x. And this variable gets initialized with the value 25. Note everything is properly typed, even the constant itself. Finally we got an if statement. First we got the equals operator and if you're wondering why it's not infixed, note that the whole thing will eventually be converted to assembly language. And infix notation is not the easiest way to do that. Then follow our variable and our constant. The business end of the deal is incrementing our variable with the value 15 and that's it. Now this is represented as a hierarchy with our initial assignment and our if statement at the same level. If our if statement had featured another nested if it would have been positioned lower in the hierarchy. The parser makes sense of the program. It relates all tokens in such a way that they make up proper statements. It's no wonder that most syntax errors are caught in this stage. Now we've broken down the source code into its elementary units, it's time to generate code. And this is what comes out, assembly language. This will result in code that is understood by the CPU. And although this is a far cry from what we started with, we can still see the initial assignment, the comparison in the if statement. Note that this jumps over the increment code if the values do not match, funny eh? And in that piece of code we jump over, we see the value 15 being added to our variable. And that's it. The assembler translates this code to object code, which is nothing more than a binary blob that can be fed to the CPU, but not quite. C, like most languages, has a runtime. This environment addresses a number of issues like the management of your application memory, 
how the program accesses variables, mechanism for passing parameters between procedures, interfacing with the operating system, and lots of other stuff. In order for your program to run, this runtime has to be added to your program. And if you used any libraries, like I.O. or string libraries, these will be added as well. And finally, there you got it, an executable program. Now, Vanilla Fort has very little of that. Sure, it's got a tokenizer, which works by one simple rule. The next word is delimited by white space. And if you got that word, it's subject to the three rules. If it's a word, execute it. If it's not a word, convert it to a number. If it's not a number, issue an error message. But then you say, we've got strings, don't we? And they're delimited by double quotes. And you'd be completely right. This is a special class of words. It's called parsing words. Did you ever wonder why there has to be a space between dot quote and the string itself? That's because dot quote is a word. And it actively parses the input stream for a double quote and displays the resulting string. The tokenizer has got absolutely nothing to do with it. Dot quote does it all by itself. And when it finishes, control is transferred back to the tokenizer, which goes on to parse the next white space delimited word. It's that simple. And note that the word is a word. It doesn't expect any parameters. Sure, it may require some values on the stack, but how they got there is of no interest to that particular word. It may be because they were put there by the user directly, or by a gazillion words before. That's why Fort is sometimes called a language without a syntax. Each word handles its own business. No parser required. Now we've got that impressive stack of programs and subsystems that make up a language. Let's see what our proud programmer did. Well, he didn't like some language features of Python, so he made a dedicated preprocessor. Which, according to his own statements, didn't even work properly. What it basically does is convert source code to source code, but just a little different. I've seen a lot of these thingies. Back in the 80s I used them to convert my old Pascal code to C code. I used the C preprocessor to let C look a bit more like Pascal. That idea was based on an article in Byte in which hardened Fortran programmers were eased into C. C++ started its life as a dedicated preprocessor on top of the C preprocessor. Because basically all you need to do object-oriented C is add lots of syntactic sugar. Every half-witted computer science professor can tell you that. Since my own Ford compiler has a preprocessor, I use that capability to make my own object-oriented Ford. But there's a difference. While C++ and object-oriented C are dedicated preprocessors, my Ford preprocessor, the C preprocessor and the well-known M4 preprocessor are programmable preprocessors. You can define your own macros and they will be applied to your source code, as we've seen. So no, I wouldn't call a handful of macros a language. Why would I call a bunch of building keywords a language? And that's my beef with this video. All this guy did was build a dedicated preprocessor for Python and called it a language. Somehow, it doesn't feel good. <laughs> So what did I do to get all this anger and frustration out of my system? I built a preprocessor for, well, I'm not going to try to pronounce that. Anyway, it's a so-called esoteric language with a surprisingly verbose syntax. And I built that preprocessor in one of the most humble languages I know, UBasic Fort. All it does is convert thing stuff into UBasic Fort source code. I even added my own commands, thus extending the language. What do you think? Did I build a language or not? I'm Hans Beesmer, and this was another episode of Back and Forth. <laughs>